What we'll do next is that we'll have a very bird's eye view look at uh, the general approach of creating strategies in equity market, and we'll try to implement the same using uh, this GLCs we just discussed. So, in uh, in not only in equity markets, in uh, general, uh, we can uh, view the landscape of the strategies in these two dimensions. One is the underlying trading view that you want to express, or as the uh, popular term uh, is used now, the risk factor that you are trying to capture. And the second is uh, the investment or the trading style. For example, if you're a technical trader or if you're a quant-oriented trader or you're a fundamental trader. So based on this, I have uh, divided uh, mo most of the common trading strategies in this uh, few segments. So for example, on the fundamental side, if you are, uh, if you are trading uh, based on momentum or trending, it's typically a factor-based investing, where you, where you based on fundamental factors and as well as the price data, you figure out the, uh, the underlying momentum risk factor and then you try to take a view on that. On the other hand, if you're using the same idea expressing in terms of technical trading, you, you typically use uh, in, uh, indicators like uh, moving averages, or if you're a charting guy, you'll be using continuation chart patterns. So for example, uh, uh, so for example, it's a megaphone, or it's, it's a triangle, or if you're a quant fund, then you'll be approaching it slightly differently. You'll try to first identify the, the type of the momentum factor that you have there, whether it's a time series based momentum factor or it's a cross-sectional momentum factor. That means whether you want to trade a single underlying over a period of time or you want to capture the momentum across a cross-section at any given point in time and you will uh, devise the trade strategies based on that. Similarly, for mean reversion trades, for example, technical traders typically go for the swing trades or the retracement patterns or the pivot trading types. And the most famous fundamental uh, strategies like value investing is basically a mean reversion trade. Uh, stock has been become very cheap compared to its fundamental value. So you assume that it will return to its fundamental value, so you buy it. It's basically a mean reversion trade. On the other hand, if you're a quant fund, that becomes a pair trading for you, or most of the statistical arbitrage is in fact uh, kind of a mean reversion trade. Similarly, uh, the breakout trades for a technical uh, trader, it will be opening range breakout, dual thirds, or pattern based breakout. For fundamental, it will be more like a relative value strategies. For quant, it will be an advanced model like regime switching models or hidden market models. And similarly, a very important part is, uh, a very important risk factor is carry. Carry is uh, the risk factor. I, I believe that most of us understand this trending or the main revision or the breakout kind of moves in the underlying. Carry is something that the risk factor where you make profit or loss when nothing changes, just time pass. And uh, typically, uh, the carry strategies in technical uh, traders handbook is uh, executed through selling vol, uh, typical short gamma strategies based on if you identify a particular underlying is range based, so it will not break out, so you sell vol and you basically collect the theta. Similarly, in the quant funds, the, all the, the basic tenets of the high frequency market making is based on this. They are basically trying to catch the difference between the bid and offer. And uh, similarly, for fundamental, it is usually the cross-country and the cross-asset relative value. So typical example is the FX carry trade, where you uh, borrow in a, in a cheap currency and lend in an expensive currency. For example, borrow in Japanese yen or euro, or lend in, say, INR or dollar even. And finally, the event-based uh, risk factor which is uh, typically uh, implemented in the quant circle uh, based on uh, news-based automated uh, trading. And the fundamental, it is usually fully discretionary. And uh, honestly, to be, uh, to, be, to be honest, there is nothing equivalent in the technical um, trader's handbook. So, moving from the landscape, so here is a schematic of uh, typical systematic equity strategies, execution, 
from ideation to execution. So as you can see, there are at least five layers here. The first layer is data input layer. So data input is a very important layer because as you know the phrase garbage in and garbage out. So if your data is not correct, no matter how much time is spent in um, fine tuning your um, strategy, it will ultimately generate a uh, totally random signal. So next comes the data processing layer. The data processing layer is typically where we are trying to uh, create some output from the input data. In technical tra traders term, we call them mostly indicators. So these are basically function of uh, the data. For example, these are function of uh, past prices, but it has got nothing to do with anything else. So for example, it doesn't take into account your current positions or your risk management criteria, nothing. It's just a function of your input data. The next layer is the intelligence layer. This is where you generate your signal. This is your core trading rule or trading model. This is where you spend most of your time in the research. So the input to this uh, model is your indicators. They can be unfiltered data itself, the input data, or they can be a function on, applied on the input data. But these will be the inputs for this model. And the output of this will be fed into your order management module. Order management module will take your input signal, it will take your current portfolio positions, and also it will take into your risk management rules. And based on all this, it will create a order. And then it goes to your execution module, which will decide that for a given chunk of order, how best to execute it. What are the exchanges to route it to? or how to slice and dice and place the orders in case it's a very large order, and so on. So as you can see, that a uh, very important part of this entire thing is, uh, one, is gathering proper data, and two, validating your trading rules. So gathering, uh, uh, gathering proper data is not an easy task. At the same time, the validating and optimizing your trading rule is also not a very uh, easy task. So trade, most of the traders spend considerable time doing this. So this is where the backtesting comes in. And, and backtesting is basically devising a rule based on your input and instead of doing the actual execution, do a dummy execution and figure out how it, how it uh, improves or how it uh, deteriorates your trading strategy and then keep on doing this till you are satisfied that you have a workable strategy. And the forward test is to validate your backtesting because backtesting suffers from many biases which we'll see in the next slide. So uh, coming from the last one, uh, the inputs to your strategies should be uh, as diverse as possible. So price, the open, high, low, close, volume data is one set of inputs. There can be other inputs like positioning information. These are very, very useful inputs. So for example, how much and what sort of participants are long and what sort of participants are short in the markets. And also the fundamental information like the price earning ratios or the macroeconomic information like the interest rates or the yield curve slopes. These all are disparate and relevant inputs. And also recently, uh, is getting favor is the non-market information like your sentiment and analyst ratings and other things. Now, based on this, you will create your trading rules and logic. Now, creating trading and ru rules and logic can be done in two di different ways. So first, uh, from your experience, you can specify a set of hypotheses. So for example, you can say that if I see that five year, uh, five day moving average is going up, crossing up the 20 day moving average, then I think uh, the price is going to go up. It's a basic momentum crossover signal. So you can develop this hypothesis and then you can run a backtest to validate that hypothesis. This is, this is coming from your experience as a trader or um, you learned it from someone else or a webinar like this, or it can be done a totally uh, data dependent way in a sense that you create such a model that if you feed that model with data, enough data, 
it will spit out the rules that it should follow given the data. So the same type of uh, model is uh, getting a bit more popularity right now. Uh, these are the typical machine learning models that you hear about. Uh, this is a typical example of the supervised uh, models uh, in machine learning. We'll also see an example of this. And then comes the step of backtesting and forward testing. It's a very, very crucial step. Why? Uh, because sometimes it's very difficult to do a backtesting. For example, if you're a macro trader, if you're, if you're trading uh, based on your discretionary view, uh, for example, the, the current account balance of US is, is the worst for, for almost a decade. So you think that the, the US currency, the USD, will, will go down. But it is very difficult to taste because you do not have any equivalent data back in history. So here, of course, you cannot do a backtest. But in cases where you can, you should always. Sometimes people don't. They take shortcuts. Even if they do a backtest, they take shortcuts like you assume that you can trade on close. Of course, you cannot trade on close because in most exchanges, the close is a derived price. It's not an actual traded price. People ignore that. Uh, people ignore the cost of shorting. So, for example, you devise a long short strategy, but you forget the you forget the cost of borrowing for the shorts. The shorts in sometimes can be very very costly to borrow, and that can impact your strategy piano. Uh, people ignore the things like margin costs. So, if you have a leveraged product strategy and if you have a limited capital, your margin call can put you out of your strategy. And if you don't take that account, then your backtest will show a very different result than what you can analyze and what you can realize. The second part of the backtesting is that the backtesting has many biases. So, for example, if you do a many, many uh, search of similar models in a given set of data, there is a high chance that we end up with a strategy that works because, because of just simply the overfitting. So this kind of biases are called data mining biases. Then you have the problem of the size of the bias. So if you're uh, coming up with a strategy that involves many stocks or maybe all stocks in a particular exchange, then you should, ha you should actually take into account the stocks that were once trading but then delisted. And if you don't, then you will be a victim of the cyberbership bias. And then the look-ahead bias, this is one of the most dangerous things. Here, because of a small mistake in your process of backtesting or in your code, you, your backtest can actually be in a position where you can look into the future. It's getting data point from ahead of time. And that can, Means that can be very damaging for your backtest. So an uh, ideal backtest uh, platform should be uh, avoiding most of these biases. Now, all the, of course, the platform cannot avoid all the biases. Some has to be controlled by the, the human behind it, of course. But it should be flexible, and it should be event-driven. Event-driven backtester avoids the look-ahead bias. And, of course, it should come with built-in analytics, because the backtesting and getting the PNL is not enough. You have to also estimate what is the risk you are taking for the same amount of PNL, and also how can your backtest performance change? In what scenario, which is working now, will stop working? So this is a very critical part of backtesting. So an ideal platform should offer all this, and ideally the input data that you saw that is so important, garbage in and garbage out. Finally. Once you have a strategy, that is not enough. Uh, very few trader uh, I know they sh they trade on a single strategy because a single strategy can go wrong anytime. So typically, you'd like to have a multiple strategy and trade them as a portfolio. 